Hello, everyone, and welcome to COVID Updates, where we are and where we go from here. My name is Elissa Baldwin with the Patient Education Team at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Following a short presentation by our key opinion leader, we will have a facilitated discussion where we will cover the most common questions asked of our LLS information specialists, as well as questions that have come in through our online community. We would like to acknowledge Beijing, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Kite, a Gilead company, Pfizer, Farmer Cyclics, an AbV company, and Janssen Biotech for their support of this program. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Janice Gabrilov, the James F. Holland Professor of Medicine and Associate Director of Education and Training for the Tisch Cancer Institute. She is also the director of the Clinical Research Education Program at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Dr. Gabrilov works on the development of novel therapeutics for leukemia and has been awarded multiple patents for drugs approved by the FDA to treat myeloid leukemias and alleviate harmful effects of chemotherapy. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Thank you for volunteering your time and expertise. Dr. Gabrielov, I am now privileged to turn the program over to you. Welcome, everyone. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here today with all of you uh, to discuss this um, really important topic. I thought I would first start with a guide uh, for our discussion today. I'm going to start with an overview with an optimistic lens about where we started and where we're heading uh, with COVID-19. We'll talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 variants and what they are and why do we care. We'll then move into a little bit of an understanding of immune responses to COVID-19 and how that actually informs our concerns regarding risk and treatment interventions. Moving on to vaccinations and their implications for health and well being, challenges specifically in patients with hematologic malignancies, and current recommendations. And we'll spend a little time talking about the restoration of well being after COVID and a practical guide for best practices to avoid contracting COVID 19 if possible. So it's obviously clear that uh, SARS-CoV-2 remains an active concern for patients with immune who are immune compromised, including patients with hematologic malignancies and those receiving uh, stem cell or cell therapeutic approaches. Vaccination remains the mainstay with added therapeutic modalities to complement this approach and we'll talk a little bit about why vaccination is so important. It's also, as we think about the challenges we, conf we are confronted with uh, in the realm of COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic, it's important to take a step back and realize that actually we are over time moving from a dreadful disease to a milder, more manageable disease over time, following the path of other coronaviruses, such as the common cold, which many think a thousand years ago actually started as a more severe infection. And this pathway of moving from a severe disease to a much milder, more manageable uh, condition is really predicted by experts employing computer models recently published in Nature Medicine. For this to really be realized, this requires sustained long-lasting immunity against severe disease among a significant component of the population. Um, and that may not actually prevent transmission or mild disease, but the most important goal is to prevent severe disease among all of those who might come in contact uh, with this infection. So let's spend a little time about talking about uh, COVID-19 and the hot topic of variants. 
So first and foremost, it's important to remember that uh, not just for COVID-19, but for most viruses that exist, variants arise from something called mutations in the viral genome or the blueprint, the code for how that virus should behave, replicate, and give rise to more of itself. And it's really a natural product of viral replication. If you think about it, you need to get a flu vaccine every year because the flu virus changes each year. It has a different mechanism that it uses to change than what we know for COVID, but nevertheless, it changes. And so that's why we need to get vaccinated every year with a slightly different uh, flu vaccination. When we talk about how these variants arise from mutations, it's important to think about what is a mutation. A mutation refers to a single change in the virus's genetic code in that blueprint that gives instructions, that set of instructions that the virus has for how it should behave. And those mutations happen frequently but only sometimes actually change the characteristics of a virus. So again, these mutations are part of part and parcel of every virus. In this instance, those mutations seem to occur a bit more frequently, but they don't always result in characteristics that are of concern. Only in some instances are the changes consistent with characteristics of a virus that we need to be um, more prudent about. So a variant is a virus with a genetic code that has been altered by one or more mutations. In some cases, there are a group of variants, as we'll come to in a moment. We sometimes call those groups lineages that have similar genetic changes that give rise to shared characteristics or attributes. And as a result, they may be designated by um, experts in the field and organizations like the NIH or the CDC within this country as variants to be monitored because they have certain characteristics that make us a little more worried about them or characteristics that we really are not that concerned about. And so we might not label them at all in this instance. So variants to be monitored, variants of concern, or variants of interest. And that classification of a variant in those respective categories really relates to the following. Does the variant possess properties that are associated with the likelihood it would be more transmissible? Could it potentially cause more severe disease? Could it be resistant to antibodies from previous infections or vaccination or therapeutics that we've already developed? Or does it show an ability to evade diagnostic detection? So these criteria are what are used to determine by national organizations and experts in the field to consider whether a variant is worthwhile following, monitoring, be of concern or be of interest. And just to understand this a little better, here's just a cartoon that shows antibodies that might be induced in your body uh, when you're exposed to uh, uh, COVID or any virus. And that those, or you've been vaccinated, such as with uh, the current vaccines or the flu vaccine, you make a variety of antibodies that recognize in our standard responsive virus a number of special features here indicated by this pretty uh, pinkish red uh, feature or this green feature. These become the features that the antibodies uh, will attack. And as a result of binding to those features will neutralize the virus fully. When a variant comes around, they may still have some features that are uh, approachable, but they may have some new features as indicated in blue or black here. And the antibodies that were generated from prior infection or from vaccination may still neutralize or may still have some impact, 
but not as fully. So when we talk about a variant not being responsive more or less, it's the degree to which there is some retention or lack thereof of the ability of an antibody uh, to actually neutralize or partially neutralize um, a, a given uh, virus uh, uh, variant. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So this is not a quiz to really know the different variants, but you certainly are all familiar with the the major variants from the ancestral original strain of COVID-19 appearing in 2019 at the end of the year, all the way from, from alpha through uh, Omicron most recently. And you can see that of the Omicron, there are many similar types of variants. They're not really variants, they're uh, lineages within that variant of Omicron. And we've heard about many of these BA4, BA5, and more recently the BQ versions. And this has to do with how transmissible they are. So the Omicron BA versions were more transmissible than some of the earlier variants. Um, but they and there was more of a more of a uh, infection breakthrough, largely with mild disease as opposed to severe disease with earlier variants. Um, and then with the BQ variants of Omicron, they appear to have an even greater advantage of of transmission. There are a number of other variants that we'll hear about. Uh, that are actively monitored by the CDC and the NIH and other regulatory groups to really, um, some of which, as I mentioned, will be important and some of which will not. Uh, a recent version, XBB, emerged from prior BA variants and appears to not be as much of a concern as originally uh, thought. This just shows you, uh, for those of of you who are visual learners, the wave of these variants globally over time. Uh, you can see the original strain all the way through to the current uh, BA.5 version of uh, Omicron. And this is uh, depicted for North America. And you can see that the lifespan of the variant changes and is reduced uh, as a function of some of the interventions uh, that we've had um, in terms of how quickly these come and go uh, and why we, why we leave it to authorities to really let us know which variants to be most concerned about. But you can see that the lifespan of these variants really becomes less and less over time. So when uh, an individual is actually exposed to COVID-2 uh, COVID or COVID-19, there are two parts of our immune system that are activated. And we're just gonna talk about this briefly because it helps us understand some of the risk factors. And it also helps us understand the role of immunization and vaccination. So the first response to any infection and absolutely important in exposure to COVID-19 is what we call the innate immune response. This is the first line of defense. It is triggered when a person, a host, recognizes that something foreign has arrived and needs to be gotten rid of. And this includes a number of uh, cellular elements such as neutrophil granulocytes, which are a special type of white cell that fight uh, largely bacterial infections, but are also important for viruses. Monocytes and macrophages, which are like little Pac-Men uh, and they're major garbage collectors. Even lobsters have monocytes and macrophages and they eat up anything foreign in sight. And a variety of other uh, lymphoid elements, dendritic cells, and NK and natural killer cells. 
In addition, epithelial cells, which are barriers in our mouth and our nose and our intestinal tract, also serve as a first line of defense. And one of the ways they defend us is by releasing a variety of proteins, um, which are called cytokines. And this can be very beneficial, but in some cases, if there is too much or an excessive amount of those cytokines produced, uh, that can give rise to a cytokine storm. And some of the therapeutic approaches that have been uh, instigated have uh, included a blockade of these cytokines when they are too uh, abundant uh, and too, um, uh, uh, too strong. In addition, you can see that since the innate immune response is important at the start, to try to prevent viral entry, patients who are neutropenic or have low neutrophil counts um, uh, in the setting of both uh, treatments for non-cancer as well as treatments for solid tumor malignancies and blood cell cancers uh, have an increased risk initially when their neutrophil count is low because they don't have the same capacity for mounting this full innate immune response, although there are other cells that can help with that. The second part of the immune response is the adaptive immune response. And this is um, the educated uh, portion of the immune system, which involves cells called B cells and T cells. And the job of B cells are to make antibodies and the job of T cells are to eliminate virally infected cells or to provide help to the support the rest of the immune system. And this is the job of two different types of T cells called CD8 and CD4 respectively. And their overall role is to control not viral entry but viral replication. And it's in particularly important for long-term protection against severe disease, which is what we care about most. This is a cartoon taken from that same paper published in Cell that just gives you a feeling for the time course of how your immune system um, gets activated. Here we're looking at the magnitude of the response and here we're looking at the time factor for the immune response. And in a, a characteristically um, ideal situation, you're exposed to a virus, your innate immune response immediately comes into, into action and allows that viral load to be reduced. And then subsequently, um, your adaptive immune response comes into play uh, to really prevent uh, viral replication. In a typical COVID-19 infection, you can see that the, you're exposed to virus, the innate immune system comes into play that somehow slowly affects the replication, the, the entry of the virus, uh, which continues to in, come into the system and then the adaptive immune uh, system comes into play, which will diminish viral replication and uh, render um, a reduction in the overall severity of the infection. In severe infection, and these are all idealized for a non-vaccinated individual, in a severe infection, the viral load gets ahead of us. And the innate immune system, while trying very hard to catch up, is not able to really effectively block entry. And the adaptive immune system may be delayed, again, not able uh, to catch up with, uh, with disease that is severe already. So in general, there are, in terms of infection, um, and if, if we put aside the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system plays an important role and probably one of the most critical roles in the severity of infection. In asymptomatic individuals, the antibody uh, production is, plays a greater role 
uh, in rendering that um, asymptomatic status than, than T cells. On the other hand, as we move through a more uh, clinically significant infection, T cell function actually is more important in preventing uh, and alleviating uh, severe infection, which is something uh, that we greatly uh, care about. So if we keep those thoughts in mind, that little brief tutorial in mind, let's move into the realm of vaccination. And of course we have um, the speed at which vaccine development uh, came about is a marvel in and of itself. And there are really um, uh, three major uh, types of vaccination. In this country, we only have the messenger RNA virus uh, vaccine, the messenger RNA virus, and the adjuvanted protein virus of Novavax, which is the newcomer on the block. The adenovirus vector uh, um, uh, vaccinations, while used abroad, uh, are no longer being used uh, uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, the FDA has no longer uh, allowed them to be used in the U.S. So if we look globally at what's happening with vaccination rates, and this is taken from a recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in September of 2022, uh, this looks at is color coded for the degree of vaccination of populations. And you can see that within Canada, many regions in South America, China, Australia, New Zealand, the vaccination rates are extraordinarily high. In the US, uh, we have about 70% of the population uh, being vaccinated. But you can see that in pockets in Eastern Europe and Asia, and in Africa, there is a large percentage of individuals who remain uh, unvaccinated. And this is one of the challenges uh, for the continued um, uh, emergence of variants of COVID-19 in the absence of vaccination. At the same time, it's estimated that globally, uh, COVID-19 vaccination in its first year of rollout saved 20 million lives. So when we think about vaccination, we of course are concerned about the recent breakthroughs and I allu alluded to this uh, in terms of uh, breakthrough cases, but you can see that with both Delta and with Omicron, uh, that this largely occurred in individuals who were unvaccinated. And it's the unvaccinated population that remains uh, the greatest um, uh, 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 issue and concern uh, in the current environment. That's not to say that we haven't seen breakthrough cases in vaccinated individuals, but for the most part, these have been considerably uh, milder. And this just demonstrates this if we look at Pfizer, uh, the Pfizer uh, for which there is the most data, the efficacy against symptomatic disease, including severe disease, um, hospitalization and ICU admissions were really in the 95%. With the Omicron that did drop, uh, but still there was considerable protection uh, with 70% uh, efficacy against hospitalization or against ICU admission. So the immunological impact of vaccination uh, has been that prior boosting certainly increases neutralizing antibodies to Omicron, but they do wane over time. And ergo the, the reason for the newer bivalent vaccination uh, to boost um, uh, neutralizing antibodies that will be protective against a broader range of variants. The good news, however, is in those who have that capacity, T cell responses that are induced by vaccines have more than 80% cross-reactivity to Omicron and to prior variants. 
So it's the T cell response that I mentioned becomes really the most important for protection against severe disease, which is what we are really most worried about. And so vaccination appears to have a significant impact and a, a prolonged protective impact on preventing severe infection uh, across a broad range of variants and likely against variants for the future. There is evidence that hybrid immunity from both vaccination and infection provides even greater and more durable protection than either alone. And ergo, the reason for the recommendation for vaccination, even in individuals who have previously um, encountered uh, infection with COVID-19. And additional promising research is ongoing uh, that may inform uh, therapy of the role of specific mucosal, the lining of our airways, the lining of our nose, and cellular immunity at the site where the virus tries to enter may play an important role. And there are already uh, nasal sprays under development uh, in this regard. So if we move to um, uh, patients uh, with uh, malignancy, um, we know and this is, was published in Cancer Cell. We know that um, patients with solid tumors uh, are in general have the ability to have high antibody responses uh, to uh, COVID-19 vaccination. However, patients with hematologic malignancies patients who have received anti-CD20 antibody treatment, which includes not only patients with lymphoproliferative dis disorders, but patients with autoimmune disease in particular, those who have been exposed or have received stem cell transplant for a variety of indications and CAR T cell therapy, in general, have a lower antibody response. Now, as you know, and now as you now know, antibody response is not the whole story. And LLS is actively supporting research to really look at um, the, whether patients with uh, these conditions are able to mount a T cell response, which we know is equally, if not more so important over time. This is a little busy, but it's taken from a recent publication in Blood by Langer Baines and uh, Michael Halleck, um, looking at the current, the current standing of therapeutic guidelines uh, for um, vaccination and therapeutic intervention uh, for COVID-19. I say this was published in um, uh, July of this year, but we know that this is a constantly changing um, uh, rule, role of guidelines and recommendations. And it's important to uh, be aware that we are all surrounded by experts. I have patients who come to me with a question and I will tell them that I need to check with my infectious disease colleague and I get back to them. The, the recommendations are changing, and the good news from that is that there are experts paying attention, revising recommendations, and optimizing strategies to keep us all safe and as well as possible. And having maintaining that active conversation with, uh, with your healthcare providers um, is critical to really optimizing uh, the care and the approach of patients with hematologic malignancies. So currently, uh, of course, there are um, uh, COVID-19 vaccinations, uh, both uh, first and second and the two boosters, now followed by the bivalent uh, booster that are recommended. For those patients who do not mount an antibody response even though it's possible that they may have a T cell response, which we haven't measured and are just, the data is just beginning to come to the fore, the recommendation is still uh, to provide um, passive immunization with uh, medication uh, treatment such as Evusheld. 
even with the newer Omicron strains that appear to be less impacted by Evusheld. Haunting back to the cartoon I showed you, ineffective does not mean that, or less effective does not mean that it is completely ineffective. Um, and since we don't know for sure, and since there is a possibility that the variant's lifespan will change and a new variant will come along that will be more responsive, the recommendation still as of November 14th to administer Evusheld, uh, even if its efficacy may not be as great as what it had been in the past. I'm confident that there will be newer passive immunization approaches um, in, the, in the not too distant uh, future. For those patients with hematologic malignancies who actually develop uh, COVID-19, uh, again, the treatment paradigm has changed. Um, some of the monoclonal antibodies that we had are currently not active against um, the current strains, but are held in reserve uh, for future if needed. Um, and the antiviral agents have really uh, come into play. There are also recommendations for moderate to severe COVID-19, which involve both uh, remdesivir as well as um, inhibitors of IL-6, the whole cytokine cascade that I mentioned, and inhibitors of JAK2, again, to block that cytokine cascade. And these, of course, are done in concert with a range of healthcare provider and experts, along with patients and their families. Some of the additional challenges for patients with hematologic malignancies and recipients of cellular therapies is that patient, these patients are at increased risk for prolonged viral shedding. Uh, we do not know whether that viral shedding is consistent with um, infectious virus or whether it's footprints related to um, elements of the virus. But in, in general, it is assumed that that prolonged viral shedding may include some uh, active virus. And so for patients with hematologic malignancies, the recommendation is that really, um, at least for our own facility, they are not seen in a usual environment uh, for at least 21 days, but can be seen in an environment where we see uh, patients um, with, uh, uh, who've had exposure to COVID-19. Uh, these patients often have more protracted courses, especially in lymphoid malignancies. Uh, they may be at risk for reinfection or reactivation, uh, may still be at risk for more severe disease. And so monitoring of symptoms and intervention with appropriate modalities, as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, becomes very important. So remaining vigilant, uh, aware, sharing your symptoms with your care provider or as family members, um, uh, being advocates for early intervention is really key. Severity of infection may also be uh, correlated with the degree and duration of a low white count, the degree of impaired T cell function, and also the presence of low immunoglobulins or low production of antibody. I will just say that there are patients who have low antibody levels and are what we call hypogammaglobulinemic, but they are still able to mount uh, an antibody response uh, to a vaccination. So if you are hypogammaglobulinemic, it does not automatically mean that you cannot mount an appropriate response uh, to vaccination, which is why we recommend vaccination for everyone unless there is a medical contraindication to doing so. This is a nice cartoon that just kind of summarizes the current therapeutic uh, interventions just from an understanding perspective. There are antiviral uh, medicines that attack the virus itself. There are medications, antibodies that block some of the cytokine storms specifically against interleukin-6, which is one of the 
uh, proteins made by the immune system to fight um, viral infection, but can also cause harm when produced in excess. Uh, there are antibodies against the spike protein itself, which currently are being put on the shelf uh, since the current strains are not as responsive to these. Antibodies to uh, signaling cascades that pass on the message from a uh, viral uh, infection, uh, and we have uh, effective uh, medications to, to block those. Um, uh, uh, antiviral medicines that prevent uh, viral uh, replication, and then steroids that are used uh, for nonspecific inflammation uh, at the level of uh, the genetic code. Some new treatments that are on the horizon include the use of mesenchymal stem cells. These are cells that possess immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory properties. They're also inherently resistant uh, to COVID-19, which makes them uh, quite attractive um, uh, since they lack receptors uh, for uh, the virus, uh, but this is still an investigational strategy as are adoptive immunotherapy, uh, looking at infusions of uh, COVID-19 specific T cells and natural killer cells. Uh, but you'll be hearing more about this in the not too distant future. So in our last uh, a few minutes together, I wanted to focus on um, really looking at restoration of well-being after COVID-19 infection in both healthcare um, family uh, caregivers, uh, friends, and, and patients. Um, I've indicated here that there are a number of symptoms that can occur after COVID, including weight loss, disruption of smell, uh, changes in morale with depression that may actually be related to IL-6 production, and then a variety of autoimmune phenomena. Um, I've also listed here persons that are most vulnerable with weight loss being all patients, smell disruption and depression being more in younger adults and younger uh, female adults uh, in the realm of smell disruption in particular. Um, the treatment prevention for each of these, uh, we have a number of approaches uh, for weight loss, nutrition, and diet. So I would certainly uh, advocate that in working with your healthcare providers, uh, really enlisting the help and uh, help and support of nutritionists, um, physical therapists to promote exercise and meditation uh, to uh, counteract um, depression. Uh, sometimes there is a time and place for medical interventions um, and encouraging the discontinuation of alcohol if that's something that's um, being pursued. Um, maintenance of normal nutrition, sleep, and exercise are uh, also uh, important. So finally, how can we protect against COVID-19? Um, just give you some practical guide here. First and foremost, it may sound odd, but get a flu shot. There is some compelling data to say that the enhancement of the immune system especially the adaptive immune system through a flu shot may actually uh, confer protection uh, against COVID-19. So getting a flu shot is extremely important. Try enjoying the outdoors, dressed for the occasion, of course, um, since the outdoors seems to be uh, a safer environment. Maintain good general and oral hygiene as well as hand washing. Good nutrition as much as, much as possible. Avoid noisy, crowded indoor places at peak hours and for extended periods, especially during the holidays. And be selective about outings. Um, really focus on those that are important to you and your family. Self-care and self-stress reduction, 
Wear an N95 mask that fits well when visiting indoor places. Avoid poorly ventilated indoor spaces and where possible open windows. Alert your healthcare provider about any symptoms to allow for timely interventions. Don't depend on your own ability to test um, and keep your symptoms a secret. And then correct for vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D is very important for both innate and adaptive immune responses. And although not clearly uh, been shown to be correlated with severity of disease, is an important constituency in your overall immune uh, response. So it's important uh, to um, uh, correct this, especially since vitamin D deficiency is something that is not uncommon in patients with lymphoid malignancies in particular. So with that, I think we'll go back to uh, our um, uh, our host and um, and engage in discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Gabriela, for your informative presentation. As you know, blood cancer patients and their families have significant concerns as we move into our third winter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Hopefully today, we will be able to answer the most pressing questions that our patients have about COVID and staying safe as we move into the holidays. So as we approach cold and flu season, we are now looking at four respiratory viruses, the cold, flu, RSV, and COVID. How can patients know the difference between the symptoms of these viruses and whether or not they should be concerned it's COVID? And also, would you explain what RSV is for our viewers who don't know? Of course. Um, great question. Uh, so first and foremost, RSV. RSV stands for respiratory syncytial virus, and it's a virus that has been around for a long time and causes inflammation in the airways in the lung, in particular the tiny airways. A way to think about this is when we look at a tree, we know it has a large trunk, and then it has many, many branches that branch into smaller and smaller branches. Our lungs and our airways are very similar to a tree. And the very distal, the very distant, small little airways are like the very tiny branches on a tree. And they become inflamed with RSV. And we have a name for that, as we have a name for everything. It's called bronchiolitis inflammation of the small, tiny airways called bronchioles. So, and this has largely been an infection of concern in children. It's particularly a concern for babies where uh, uh, infants can become quite ill with this, but also is a concern for our patient population, especially those undergoing uh, stem cell transplants. Um, and so uh, in hospitals, infection control groups really monitor, uh, survey uh, for RSV fairly regularly to be sure that hospital floors are, and personnel on those floors are free of infection. And if not, something is noted uh, and infection control moves in. Mm -hmm. um, in for, during the winter, I think the safest advice I can give is if somebody has any, many of these symptoms in the beginning are very similar. So I would encourage people not to try to guess, not to rely just on a home kit, Mm -hmm. uh, they really should call their healthcare providers um, and be tested. The tests that are most helpful are something called a respiratory biofire, which looks at a panel of viruses that are known to cause infections, uh, 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 respiratory infections. And each may be treated really just symptomatically or with specific interventions, um, but not knowing your healthcare provider can't properly advise. The best and most reliable test for COVID is still the swab for PCR. 
while the diagnostic kits, the rapid kits, especially the Abbott kit, appears to still be uh, quite helpful in um, identifying COVID-19 infections, even with the new variants, it is hampered by the viral load. So a lot of our strategies to reduce infection, especially masking, have to do with reducing the viral load. Mm -hmm. If you're exposed to one virus, as opposed to a hundred viral particles, your ability to prevent entry and block replication is going to be more effective than if you're exposed to a million virus particles. And uh, likewise, the, the home kits are very, um, uh, depend on the viral load. If there's a lot of virus, they'll be very reliable. If there's very little, they may not be. But the PCR is much more sensitive. It can detect, you know, uh, much, much greater, um, one in a million uh, particles. Uh, so I think the safest advice is if you are having any symptoms of an upper respiratory infection, um, you should really contact your healthcare provider and find a way to easily go to have a swab, a PCR swab, and a biofire test to know exactly what you're dealing with. Yes, that is very good advice. It's good to, I agree, not guess and just find out exactly, exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, now, let's discuss current variants and how they affect us. We've heard for months that BA4 and BA5, but the virus has evolved rapidly, and there are now more offshoots of Omicron, as you discussed in your presentation. Now, with these new variants, is there real concern about them becoming immune evasive, essentially defeating the protection of the vaccine or natural immunity from prior infection? So at the current time, um, there is really no evidence that the variants of concern are likely to um, be able to escape immune surveillance, especially T cell immune surveillance, which appears to be really the more important in the long run for preventing severe infection. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's very good data that in non immune compromised individuals, that it's the T cell immune response that has remained consistent across variants to date. So there's no a priori reason to think that that will suddenly change. Um, it's possible that the antibody response will not be as optimal with uh, additional variants. Um, but not, not subtypes of Omicron. So the Omicron variants are not truly variants. They're really lineages within Omicron. They're very, very related, but they're still coming into the Omicron family. They're, you know, the Gabrielov family or your family. Uh, it's a family name. We haven't moved to a brand new family yet. Although, as I listed, there are a number of other families uh, that are utilized in the naming criteria uh, that we haven't moved on to um, as yet. But I think that there's great hope that the T cell response really appears to be very important. Um, and the humorous response is important for the, the initial entry uh, and the initial ability to fight off infection, that might change over time and we might require a different bivalent, mm -hmm. but that's an unknown. Uh, but there's nothing to suggest that the current immediate variants are going to escape what we're currently doing. 
That is very good to know, because of course we hear all these different things and they do cause fear and anxiety, particularly with our blood cancer patients and their families. So that that is great to know. Now with the virus changing so rapidly and being very different than it was in 2020, uh, what about the people who haven't been vaccinated? If they have had COVID already, do they have some level of protection? Are there other ways for them to stay protected from severe disease? So um, I, I cannot truly answer this um, reliably, but I'll tell you my thinking. So I think that uh, while I respect uh, each individual person's wish or uh, lack thereof to be vaccinated, it's clear from the evidence we have that vaccination is the greatest opportunity to really make this viral infection become milder and milder over time. Mm -hmm. um, for individuals who have had uh, COVID and subsequently get vaccinated, their protection is even greater. And so there is some, and so we call that hybrid protection. Mm -hmm. So there is some data that the um, specific protection they have to a, is very variant specific and may not extend to new, to new variants uh, with the proviso that their T cell response may actually uh, help them. Um, so I think if, if somebody has a medical or a religious reason for not being vaccinated, then I think the safest thing they can do is to still practice some degree of social distancing whenever possible. Um, wearing a mask, we know that a mask may not prevent uh, transmission, but it certainly absolutely reduces the viral load, which is critical. If you remember those curves I showed, if the virus gets a head start by having a huge viral load and it's doubling, it will be overwhelming very quickly. Whereas if it starts off very low, we may be able to get on top of it with treatment interventions and other approaches. So I think wearing a mask. And then if you do have symptoms, paying attention and getting help from a, getting diagnosed properly and getting help from care providers early will be best for you and for the people around you that you love. Absolutely. Now, um, going back to vaccines, we recently interviewed uh, the LLS Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Lee Greenberger, on the Bloodline with LLS podcast, and he shared how the virus seems to be evolving faster than we can keep up with the vaccine. Now, what is the current effectiveness of the new bivalent booster and also prior versions for those who may not have received the bivalent yet? So I think um, uh, while I ap appreciate that the virus is changing rapidly, as I mentioned, all this is a natural process for all viruses and uh, COVID seems to be doing it a bit faster than than some other viruses. On the other hand, it is not doing, it doesn't undergo changes uh, that sometimes are even more problematic. That uh, So uh, in that case, it's, it's um, in that sense, it's behaving itself. Um, but I, I think that uh, the, the current um, uh, vaccinations, I, I think that what may require changes is this immediate antibody response. We don't have any evidence that that antibody response to the current vaccinations isn't optimal in an otherwise healthy individual, uh, even those with comorbidities mm -hmm. uh, such as obesity or diabetes or heart disease. Um, the most protection are in older individuals over the age of 65 whose immune system is not quite as robust and are best served by getting a head start. So I think the current vaccinations are certainly have been very helpful 
and continue to be helpful. And as the data I, I, I shared with you and summarized in the recent New England Journal of Medicine paper, have really contributed to the reduction in severe disease. Mm -hmm. Severe disease really is largely occurring in patients who have not been vaccinated. And um, even in our population of patients who don't mount an appropriate immune response to vaccination, um, because there is active engagement with healthcare providers and intervention quickly with treatment strategies we have, overall, our patients are doing better than they did at the start of this pandemic. But still, for a given patient, this is a, uh, a, a very serious, potentially life-threatening infection. But I don't think that the fact that the virus is changing uh, rapidly um, means that it is getting uh, uh, more severe, that we don't have evidence for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I personally am comforted by the fact that in the population that is able to have a, a T cell response, um, that that is remaining protective against severe disease across all these variants. And it's the population as a whole that will help to protect those that are more immune compromised uh, because there is this herd protection that we talk about um, that as the otherwise healthy population, including those who are vaccinated, who have comorbidities, but are vaccinated and appropriately respond, they will help to protect others around them. So I have a little more of a a hopeful uh, uptake on this. Hope is good. I definitely like the hope uptake rather than a lot of fear and anxiety. Uh, now, can we expect new vaccines in the future that would be effective for all potential variants? So it's a great, a great question. Um, there has been uh, considerable work um, by leading investigators, some of whom are actually at my institution, Dr. Falesi and colleagues, who have been working on a universal flu vaccination. Um, and some of the lessons learned from that, I'm quite confident will go into um, better understanding how to vaccinate uh, um, more comprehensively we aren't there yet. I do think these approaches to really look at the site of entry. So again, um, there's a rich source of cells involved in adaptive immunity in our nose and our mouth, our tonsils, for example, our adenoids, uh, for those of you who had them removed when we were children, um, that, that scientists are looking at strategies to deliver uh, a vaccination, if you will, closer to those sites, uh, because that may be even more useful. So I do think that the, the one of the wonderful things, uh, the, the upside, I wouldn't say wonderful, the upside of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the rapidity at which scientific advances have been made that have impacted human health in a positive way. We aren't where we were uh, three years ago. Um, right. In general, patients do much better. And the wealth of knowledge and the sharing of information, I'm confident is going to inform newer approaches, newer vaccines that will be more efficacious and will anticipate how the virus might change next and stay ahead of it. Uh, again, computer models uh, being helpful to do that, but um, I'm hopeful that, that we'll be moving in that direction. That's great. Now, we've also heard some about uh, T-cell uh, vaccines, correct? Um, well, ways to uh, activate T-cells okay. um, and make them uh, educated as if they had uh, COVID, but 
um, so that your adaptive immunity would come to, come to fruition earlier. Okay. Um, and so uh, vaccination does that, but it takes a little longer for that to come into play. So if we wanted to readily um, allow that to occur, um, I, there are strategies ongoing and there are strategies to use cellular therapies. Mm -hmm. um, so as I, which I mentioned, uh, these uh, COVID, COVID-2 specific T cell uh, infusions, uh, but these are still investigational. Right. Now, you discussed the recommendation for high-risk patients or those who did not mount a response to the vaccine to get Evusheld in addition to the vaccine. Uh, if a patient is eligible for Evusheld, should they get it before or after vaccination? I think the recommendations have really been changing. I think now the recommendation is that there be a window of 14 days. Um, Many uh, patients who've had, many patients have already received Evusheld and are waiting to get their next dose and want to know when to get the bivalent um, vaccine relative to that. I would say if you're getting Evusheld, um, the current recommendation is to wait at least 14 days before getting vaccinated. Uh, it used to be a much longer interval, um, but I believe that is the current recommendation. Uh, I would double check with uh, your healthcare provider and their infectious disease colleagues that are often working in partnership with them uh, to know specifically what the latest recommendation is. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we you discussed earlier about testing. Um, so if a patient does test positive, what is the next step? We've heard a lot about Paxlovid and you did mention some of the other treatments. Should they be calling their healthcare provider to try to get Paxlovid? So I think if a, if a patient has who's under active treatment for hematologic malignancy or is um, has completed treatment in the not too distant past, uh, or certainly within the first several years of, of having had treatment, uh, they should be reaching out to their healthcare provider to discuss next uh, what they should be what should be done and whether they should be seen. Um, Paxlovid is the, um, in the current environment, is the first treatment of choice mm -hmm. since the monoclonal therapeutic monoclonal antibodies at the current time do not appear to be uh, efficacious for the current variant. Um, that changes moment to moment. It depends on which variant is present in your area. So what is responsible for most of the cases in New York City um, may not be what's responsible for most of the cases in LA. Um, I personally am not up to date on that and was something that I would check if I had a patient of mine in California call me, I would check with my infectious disease colleagues, which I'm sure many of my other colleagues in hematology oncology would do the, the same. But we can't assume that um, the strain is always the same, right. uh, but assuming that it is, those antibody treatments that we had have been shelved for the moment, and Paxlovid is the go-to in someone who's relatively asymptomatic or has mild disease. Better, although you, it, it said you can start this within uh, five to 10 days, it is better to start it sooner rather than later, again, to prevent the virus from uh, having any uh, replication. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, Paxlovid would be the treatment of choice. Um, that, uh, unless there was a contraindication to that, in which case other antivirals would be recommended. For most patients, who are on medications that interact with Paxlovid, those medications can be safely held for the five-day period. And that's currently our practice uh, to uh, withhold certain medications that might be used uh, for, uh, for example, hyperlipidemia. Those medications often interact with Paxlovid and can be safely held for a brief period of time. Mm -hmm. 
Now, we are in our third year of the pandemic, and a lot of people very much feel over COVID. Uh, many people have already had COVID at least once, and everyone's risk tolerance is, is different. Uh, so for those who are not needing to be quite as strict as highly immunocompromised patients, what advice would you give to stay safe from severe disease? Yeah. Now, speaking of staying safe around others, some patients would like to know if it's safe to go back to work in an office or setting that has other people. Should they be masking if they do this, or is it safe enough if they are vaccinated and boosted or just have natural immunity from a prior infection? So, excellent question. I think it's patient-specific. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on where you are in your treatment, how far along or how far out you are from having had a therapy that might impact your immune system. It may depend on whether your doctor has monitored your ability to make an antibody response uh, to the vaccination or not. Um, in general, I would say if you're an individual who has uh, been able to make an antibody response to vaccination, uh, then I think going back to the office is perfectly reasonable. I think in the RSV environment, uh, one might consider uh, wearing a mask at work, depending on the proximity you, uh, you are to co-workers. Um, if you have a private office, obviously a mask in your own office is not needed. Uh, but when you go to congregation areas, you might consider a mask, really focusing on RSV now uh, if you want to avoid that. If that's not a risk for you uh, in consultation with your healthcare provider, then um, I think that, you know, using judgment, uh, having good hygiene, being vaccinated, you know, you've responded to vaccination, avoiding huge crowds uh, where possible. Um, I think, you know, you do have to get back to living uh, for sure. Yes, and speaking of living, it is December when we are recording this and holiday gatherings are right around the corner and patients have some real concerns. They want to see their families, but the high, highest risk patients, particularly those who didn't respond to the vaccine, want to hear if there are ways to do that while staying safe. What advice would you give to those blood cancer patients and survivors, as well as their family and friends, to stay safe during the holidays? So I think there are a couple of considerations. Again, uh, I would say this should be in consultation with your healthcare team. Mm -hmm. um, because not the specifics really do matter. Um, I would say that uh, there are a lot of techniques that have been used now that we know Zoom and, and a variety of other uh, um, tools, social media tools, which I'm not a guru on, but uh, that I would consider um, assigning uh, some of the uh, uh, younger people in your family to put together a really uh, fun-filled uh, Zoom uh, interaction if you're really not encouraged to be in person. Mm -hmm. I think if you want in-person gatherings, I think outside is still uh, the safest environment mm -hmm. and a safe environment where you are together with family and friends. Um, I, I think having uh, uh, going for walks as a family during the holiday um, is, is something to consider. The biggest, uh, risk is, uh, really sitting over a family, a table of food, drinking, uh, and eating together for long periods of time. Uh, because as people drink, their voices become louder, they project more. And I think for a patient's at risk, that's likely not an ideal uh, setting uh, to participate in. 
But I think that uh, there are lots of ways to enjoy the holiday with your family. You may be, need to be a little bit creative. You need to dress, uh, dress the part for the outdoors if you're in a colder environment. But I think um, celebrating outdoors, um, having a fun adventure outdoors uh, that doesn't involve alcohol um, is probably uh, the way to go. Sounds like a good plan. Now, a question we often ask on the Bloodline with LLS podcast is about hope. As the final question for our program today, what would you say to patients and their families to give them hope for the future with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic? So first I would say, first I would say that I applaud the resilience, the fortitude, um, the courage, um, and the humanity of all of the patients that I'm fortunate to care for uh, and to be a part of their lives and to all of you who are participating in today's call. So I think um, one of the reasons I love this field is it gives us a window into the strength of the human spirit. Um, that being said, I, I think I've shared with you my perhaps sometimes more optimistic uh, glass half full. Uh, I have a great um, respect and um, a faith in, in the, what can be accomplished when science and, uh, and fortitude come together. Um, if we, if we take a step back, and while many may not feel that Dr. Fauci quite accomplished what he wanted to with this pandemic, um, the AIDS pandemic uh, really changed rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and while we're still living through COVID, uh, relatively speaking, we have made enormous progress. It's hard to see that sometimes, yeah. uh, especially at the individual level. Um, but I'm confident that we're going to make more and more progress. I think the treatments we have for patients are so much better now and, and reduce the toxicities that patients experience that may make them more vulnerable uh, to some of these viral infections. I'm hopeful about that as well. So I do think that where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, science, uh, with the support of fantastic organizations like LLS uh, that are contributing to the brain trust and the research uh, that really impacts uh, the well-being of, of all of our patients and families um, is really what I'm uh, positive and, and hopeful about. Thank you so much, Dr. Gabrielov, for sharing your expertise with us today and for your continued dedication to cancer patients. If we were not able to answer your question during this program, please contact an information specialist at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society at 1-800-955-4572 from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time or by visiting lls.org forward slash contact us. We also encourage you to please complete the program evaluation, which can be found at lls.org forward slash COVID eval, or by scanning the QR code on your screen with your smartphone. Completing the evaluation will help us to continue pro to provide the engaging and informative programming that would benefit you the most. Dr. Gabriela, Thank you again for volunteering your time with us today. And on behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Thank you all for watching this program. Take good care.